thanks a lot. This was a small act uh, which came from the conference itself. Uh, and so now I'm very happy to welcome all of you uh, back to the third and our last session of our workshop, uh, Architectural Guidelines and Best Practices for Scalable Circuit QED Quantum Computing. Um, for everybody who joining now, and quickly to recap, we had now two previous sessions. We looked already in the topics of archite architectural approaches for quantum hardware and how academia and industry can collaboratively approach um, kind of the goal of a quantum computer. And so what is missing? Actually, software, of course. And uh, it was very interesting because in both of the uh, sessions we had um, the request, one came from Cherry Chow to have a software should uh, allow uh, so-called frictionless uh, development going all the way from the application level uh, down to the quantum circuits. And the other uh, demand came, kind of came from uh, John Martinez who said, of course, software needs to be um, portable from one platform to the other uh, to allow, allow easier comparison. Um, of the different platforms. And this is uh, what we will do now and uh, address with our three speakers. So we have three talks, uh, short one to two question after each talk and after uh, all three talks, we will start into a discussion with the speaker and open to the audience in the very end. So with that, I would like to um, introduce Mike Bitchuk. Uh, Mike, maybe you can already start sharing your screen. Mike uh, is the CEO of uh, Q-Control that he founded in 2017. Also, he is a professor for quantum physics and quantum technology at the University of uh, Sydney. Mm -hmm. Mike, I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Please uh, start. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you also for being kind enough to schedule this at a decent hour in, uh, in Australia. This is not usually the benefit that I get. Um, I'm pleased to get to join this workshop. And as, uh, as we heard, there have been some really uh, heavy hitting talks that have come before uh, because of that. So first of all, I'm, I'm grateful to the organizers for including me uh, and, and including Q-Control. Um, I'm also uh, cognizant of some of the very serious discussions that have gone on so far. And so I chose in this particular presentation to take what I've deemed an irreverent approach to try and bring a little bit of levity into the discussion around uh, architecting software for a specifically quantum control in uh, quantum computing very generally, but uh, in this particular case for circuit QED based quantum computing. Um, uh, I appreciate the introduction so far. Um, I'll just uh, emphasize that Q-Control is a company which focuses on quantum control engineering deployed in quantum computing as well as other applications. And so <clears throat> everything that we'll tell you about today from our work and from a uh, general perspective on the industry and how we can move forward uh, is to me motivated by this wonderful quote uh, from Bill Gates. Uh, I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. Now, this is quite different, I would say, than the way uh, an academic scientist or specifically an academic physicist would typically approach the problem. We like to embrace the really hard things and find very clever solutions. Uh, in software, the approach is actually quite different culturally. This is one key thing that I've learned running a software company now. Uh, and by background, to be clear, uh, I'm an experimental physicist. I build trapped ion quantum computers in my academic team and I've transitioned over to running a software company. Q-Control in this space takes our expertise in quantum control engineering, which is the quantum analog of conventional control engineering. Uh, for those who are not familiar, this is the discipline that makes everything work. It makes airplanes fly and walking robots and autonomous vehicles. Um, we make that expertise available via professionally engineered software and supporting professional services. And our objective is to try and effectively unlock what we uh, sometimes cutely call the hidden potential inside of quantum hardware that can be accessed by having better control over the underlying devices. Now, our activities are generally focused on low level control. I'll tell you more about this a little bit later. But uh, as a series of tasks, we think about characterizing and identifying sources of noise and error in the hardware, 
characterizing imperfections, for instance, band limits or nonlinearities or distortions that come from transmission lines via measurements on the hardware, using that information in, and uh, new models that we develop of the physical systems in order to create numerically optimized error robust controls using concepts from uh, techniques like average Hamiltonian theory, and then taking these capabilities to build error robust control and automating all the processes around them doing auto calibration, auto tune up, auto system identification, and bringing this in a feedback loop where we have both uh, um, you know, black box optimizers and we have uh, direct reinforcement learning deploy modules that are deployable in hardware. And this has led to uh, a wide variety of customers. I've only listed a few here that span from quantum sensing through to quantum computing. Um, but uh, in the process of building this company with that guiding light that I mentioned before, these are, are the three lessons that I'll talk through as uh, I present the talk for the, for the you know, 15 minutes or so. The first is don't do it yourself if you don't need to. DIY is do it yourself. Second, professionally engineered software brings benefits that are not necessarily so obvious uh, in a lab setting. Uh, but really can be tremendous in, in the long term in terms of their impact. And the third is that we should not have purity tests about open source versus proprietary code. We should use what is best for the job. And as a company that produces both open source tools and produces proprietary code, um, you know, a key driver for us is finding what's right for bringing a solution uh, to either market or to a client, uh, not in, on trying to you know, satisfy our own personal curiosity about how something works, for instance, in, in insisting on open source code. Now, uh, you know, one of these key lessons, the first one, came to me uh, from our first hire. This is Robert Love. He's the CTO of Q Control. He comes to us from a completely non-quantum background. He builds uh, software uh, for the cloud. He's worked in a number of startups and large organizations. Uh, and his quote here is, all code is technical debt. The less code you write, the less code you have, the less debt you have. Now this honestly, this, this mindset was a surprise to me. And uh, I expected that the software engineering professionals who joined the company would attack the problems that we had by starting effectively from a blank slate and trying to come up with the, the most clever solutions. But Rob pointed me to the three virtues of developers uh, as quoted by Larry, or as uh, written by Larry Wall, the developer of uh, the Perl programming language. And those three virtues are laziness, impatience, and hubris. Now I'll only focus here on laziness. Uh, in, in his quote, the quality that makes you go to great effort to reduce overall an energy expenditure. What I learned in this process, and, and the lesson that I think is really important to our sector, is that bringing in third-party modules for challenges big and small, is essential to building high quality software across uh, the quantum computing stack and, and even within our more focused area of quantum control engineering. Now that struck me as, as surprising, but as I took a step back, I realized that it's actually not too distinct from the way we build experimental hardware. So, uh, you know, I thought about what I have in my laboratory in terms of suppliers. Uh, this is just a, a, a sampling of the kinds of instruments one might uh, see in a cavity, uh, in a circuit QED lab or even in a trapped ion lab. There are all these different suppliers who specialize in different components. And we will build things, all of us as experimentalists will build things as needed, but in general, we use the best parts. Very few of us uh, wind our own RF amplifiers to achieve high, non -linear, high linearity, low phase noise, uh, et cetera. Very few of us make our own conventional coaxial cables. There are lots of things that we accept are best handled by specialized providers, and we want them to be in integrable with our solutions, right? We use BNC or SMA, you know, these, these common connector geometries. This is what allows these tools to plug together. And because this is actually the way we build hardware, I think uh, uh, it shouldn't be too much of a, of a jump for us to think about this being the way that we build software for the emerging quantum computing stack. Because if I look here, uh, and I appreciate this is small, I just wanted to get some of the key notions across. At the, at the overall quantum computing stack, there is a huge diversity of requirement. If we start at the bottom on the left with the physical qubit hardware and go all the way up to the user interface and cloud-based access quantum as a service, uh, with a whole range of different abstraction layers in between, including quantum error correction, compilation, transpiling, et cetera, uh, there, there is a huge range of specialization. 
And I'll argue that experimental physicists, for the most part, are very good down at the bottom here um, and not necessarily experts in all the rest of it. Uh, Q-Control focuses on this layer that we call the quantum firmware layer, where we build these low-level controls that touch the underlying hardware. But even within that, which is a highly specialized layer, there is yet further specialization required. So if we look on the right now, everything above and below is abstracted. Um, we have a, an architecture that involves distributed computing, that involves a cloud compute engine to do uh, numerically taxing computational tasks and can give us some huge benefits. We have the need to interface with embedded microprocessors, which then control real-time logic like FPGAs. Uh, which will program direct digital synthesizers or arbitrary waveform generators or, uh, or similar. Now, all of these different parts of this particular layer have specialty requirements in terms of how we uh, perform control, how we write software. And so it, it's essential even within our company that we have specialization not only in um, you know, quantum control, but machine learning and beyond that machine learning at the edge versus machine learning in the cloud. So this need for specialization is a key driver in software, but everything that you see plugs into that whole stack. It's designed to be uh, an enabler for abstraction above and below. And, uh, and that method, that message is actually extremely common in the conventional software industry. And it's a lesson that, that I think our community, the quantum engineering community uh, should learn. So here's one, a great example, Zoom, right? Zoom is a specialized piece of software that entered, in this case, a, a pretty crowded market. There were products from Skype and, and Google and others uh, for uh, WebEx for, for video conferencing. Zoom has done very well because it offers a high quality product experience. It's highly specialized, but it also directly integrates with a really wide range of other tools. So there's, there's a whole Zoom app marketplace for third-party providers and for Zoom to build integrations with other tools. So you can have Zoom in your Google Calendar now, right? Um, this idea of specialist software that then integrates into other parts of the stack is, uh, is the way that we envision as a best practice for software architecture in quantum computing. And I think it aligns with what we heard before about the requests from Jerry and uh, Jerry Chow and from John Martinez. Now, uh, I mentioned another benefit, which is uh, the kind of under, I should say, appreciated value of uh, software uh, that's professionally engineered. Um, we've heard a little bit about specialization. There's also the idea of standardization. Um, and I wanted to emphasize this for a second. If you're, if you're going to build everything yourself, you are dramatically limiting your ability to leverage knowledge beyond your own small sphere. Um, I think if you are a, a coder who builds anything in Python, you're already ex implicitly accepting this as true because Python is very popular uh, based on how much uh, functionality is available in the community more than, for instance, just how good of a language it is, right? Uh, it's the ability to have a common interface and to access specialized capabilities that makes Python great. So uh, this you know, feed can be generalized to broader questions in, in the quantum compute stack. The next is efficiency and value. As an experimentalist running a lab, I would often think about the upfront cost of paying for a software license, and I would very rarely think about the net overall integrated value associated with how many graduate student years I would have to dedicate to uh, building some functionality. Um, you know, it is much more efficient to have software that is engineered by professional software engineers because the, you know, amount of time uh, expended is overall much lower and they provide solutions that are scalable. So there's this question of value is very important with professional engineered software. Um, I'll, I'll just highlight then the last bit, which is maintenance and maintainability. And anybody who's ever run a lab or even a, a theoretical research team knows uh, what a challenge it is when a graduate student moves on irrespective of how careful they've been in, um, in maintaining their code or documenting it or giving all the you know, appropriate GitHub repositories. Um, the idea of students and staff moving on is a very painful part of academic science. And when you deal with professionally engineered software, you, you are effectively buying uh, maintenance for the long term. You're, you're buying the ability to ensure that your software will continue to function uh, and be appropriately documented and be usable by newcomers in your group without having to uh, go and hunt around in some dark database somewhere. So th there are some really big benefits that come from this kind of software. 
That last question was one of open source versus proprietary code. I know this is, uh, you know, an ongoing question in the community. Um, you know, the, the general approach that Qcontrol takes is summarized in this cute commercial from, I think, the you know, early 2000s or the late 1990s from Old El Paso Tacos. Um, the, the little girl was asked, uh, do you want hard tacos or soft tacos? And she said, por que no, no los dos? Why not both? Um, I, I think this idea is important that we should always embrace the right solution for the job as opposed to pushing for purity. And as I said, Qcontrol builds open source things. We have open controls, we have closed source proprietary things. Um, sometimes people push back on, on the idea of proprietary code, but it's funny because we all you know, use proprietary things all the time. Uh, we use Autodesk, which is proprietary, Comsol, MATLAB, Mathematica. Um, we're using Zoom, Zoom is not open source. We use the right tool for the job very broadly. And I think this carries over into design of the quantum compute stack. Again, so long as the outputs are verifiable. This is a really important point. There's a huge distinction between something doing something in the background where you can't tell what it's doing and you can't tell what it's outputting and having an output that is verifiable. If our code, for instance, gives you an optimized control solution, you can then, as I'll show you in a moment, run that on your hardware and you get better performance and you can characterize the performance of that control solution with system identification tasks that tell you how robust it is, how well it works in a verification algorithm, et cetera. You can directly verify what's coming out of the code. And so I think we should not insist on full open sourcing as the, uh, the, the requirement for everything. Um, the other point here that's important is software as, as professionally engineered now is much more than just a code base. Software is service and infrastructure. So service comes in maintenance and maintainability as we heard, but also documentation. The kind of documentation that we make at Qcontrol is quite different than what say a, a graduate student or even a very dedicated postdoc who's very committed to, um, uh, to open source code development would do because we have resources to allocate to this in time and capital. Uh, but then there's also all the infrastructure management, right? That we have the ability to dedicate cloud compute resources as part of the offering instead of just a code block that then is executed, say, on a, on a local instance. Um, the last subtle point I would make is that uh, when we think about open source packages, um, it's a little bit of a, of a controversial statement, but the biggest beneficiary of open source is, is the giant tech companies. Because when we think about... Uh, you know, what advantages small companies can have in their IP. It's not their ability to litigate over a patent. It's their ability to move fast and offer something of value uh, in a way that outcompetes. And proprietary code bases are part of that. So I think as an industry, uh, if we want small players and not only the fangs working in this space, then embracing at least to some degree uh, proprietary code as something that's acceptable is very important. Now, what, what can you do with all this? Uh, well, by virtue of having a professional engineering team at Qcontrol, uh, we take our core tools, which reside in a cloud server, that's the Qcontrol core package, and then we give access to them via different interfaces using an API. Now, you can access that via our tools. For instance, the Boulder Opal package, which is uh, professional grade quantum control tools. You wanna come up with really clever learning algorithms, and deploy it on hardware. You want to uh, create new model-based optimizations for your hardware, you can do it all in Python uh, using our cloud API. If you want to learn about quantum control, you can use our web-based interface. And because these are based on specialized software with targeted plugins to other uh, toolkits, these tools can directly integrate, as I'll show you in a moment, with either custom hardware, so something sitting in a laboratory, or with cloud compute software, uh, excuse me, uh, hardware. So for instance, we do a lot of work using uh, Qiskit Pulse from IBM, using analog layer control, our tools written in Python, directly integrating and executing uh, commands via Qiskit on IBM Q uh, hardware backends. So this comes from a, a lot of the professional engineering, but another benefit here is that because our API is available to, to our customers, you can go to api.qcontrol.com, uh, you can write your own applications using the core computational capabilities that reside in Qcontrol. Uh, again, a lot of this infrastructure and then the benefits it brings, because in our API, we do all the management of, of, of uh, computational resources, we see between 10 and 100x improvements in time to solution for very complicated 
um, uh, very complicated optimizations, you know, order of magnitude gains, uh, even our code compared to local instance based on leveraging this cloud infrastructure. And then with that, as I said, we can integrate with all these different toolkits, uh, with PyQuill, with OpenPulse or, or Pulse from Qiskit. Uh, and here is just one demonstration. What we're plotting in these graphs in color scale is the error per qubit, or the, excuse me, the error per gate uh, on uh, a, a five qubit device from IBM Q is called Valencia, for those of you who, who know the backends. Uh, the x-axis is qubits, the y-axis is days, so we're doing measurements. Uh, on the left, the bright colors correspond to large error rates, the dark colors correspond to low error rates. Um, with the optimized controls that we build and then deploy, these are error robust controls, so it's not quite optimal control, it's a little bit different than that. Um, these solutions show not only 10, up to 10x improvements in error per gate, but also more than 10x improvement in homogeneity between error rates over different qubits. 10x improvement in the uh, calibration window. We can extend the calibration out to over a week using these controls instead of every 12 to 24 hours, which IBM does. And we can run our operations fully parallelized. So uh, IBM and their compilers will typically uh, sequence all their gates so that they're not overlapped in time to minimize crosstalk. We don't have to do that because we've designed these error robust controls. So this allows you to do better gates with lower error. Now, these are specialized solutions that are designed for IBM and using a, a generalized toolkit and then interact with IBM via these plugins in, in Qiskit. Um, but this is the general uh, framework of how we can operate. And of course, all of this has a lot of calibration or auto calibration and optimization in the background that becomes available as well. So uh, let me stop there uh, with that demonstration. Please visit us at the virtual booth uh, or visit us online and uh, I'll take some questions and then be uh, very much looking forward to the discussion hereafter. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, I would quickly uh, ask one question uh, about how to verify, how, how can you one ensure verifiability of a code snippet, propriety or not? Um, that goes above simple tests, for example, when uh, running optimal control on a system level. How much are um, tests in this regard developed already? I mean, you already showed um, some results, right? So maybe yeah, you I, can comment on that. So, so what we verify uh, or what we help you verify is the performance of the solutions that are output. So uh, for instance, we have a range of tools uh, now you can use things from the literature. We've built our own modules for randomized benchmarking, say. Um, but uh, we also have tools for uh, calculating or, excuse me, um, uh, determining what is the so-called quasi-static error sensitivity of a gate. So this means that we uh, apply an error. And when we apply this error, we look at the response of the system. D does the system degrade or does it appear insensitive? And uh, I may actually be able to, uh, to jump ahead here. Um, we have some demonstrations of this. It's a very efficient way of validating that, uh, oops, there we go, sorry. I know this is like nausea inducing. Here we go. This is, this is part of a validation package that exists within Boulder Opal where the x-axis is an applied error. The y-axis is the measured uh, error in your gate. Uh, in this case, this is to detuning error. You see that the IBM gate, the default, shoots up in terms of how poorly it performs. Uh, but the Q-Control robust solution stays flat, in indicating insensitivity. So we provide a range of uh, tools like this that allow you to verify the performance of the optimized controls that are output by our software. So you have a direct way to know that these solutions work well. Okay. Um, th thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot. There is uh, just another one. Um, I think we have time for this last one. Um, how much lazy can a hardware developer get on tasks that can be addressed by optimal control? So what can software do? You're muted, Mike. 
Sorry, thank you. Uh, I have to, it's a great question. Um, I need to point out that it, it, there's not very much you can do with optimal control in terms of getting lazy because optimal control is very, very sensitive to the underlying assumptions in your model. However, robust control, which is just a slightly different approach to doing the optimization, allows you to make big trades. It allows you to say, for instance, um, you know, IBM could have in their hardware spent a huge amount of effort to mitigate whatever the microwave crosstalk is that gives an unwanted AC stark shift and some unwanted sigma X coupling between qubits, you drive one and the other feels it, um, or they can just use our solutions. So by, by demonstrating that using these error robust solutions that suppress the sigma Z and the sigma X term simultaneously that appear from crosstalk, um, there is now you know, a, an obviated need to refine the hardware. So this is, it's a really powerful capability that uh, by throwing control at the problem, you have the ability to relax some hardware constraints. You might be able to tolerate more crosstalk than you would have otherwise. Uh, obviously everybody should, you know, will want to do as well as they can with hardware engineering, but uh, anybody who runs an experiment with, uh, with some kind of magnetic shielding knows that this is a dominant paradigm. You can either put you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into a passive mu metal shield to block the uh, ambient magnetic field fluctuations, or you can use an active stabilization system, which over a wide range of frequencies can give you the same performance for a fraction of the cost. And, and I think this idea of active control versus passive stability is a, um, is a key value proposition for using this kind of low-level control. Uh, thanks a lot for the answer. I hope uh, this so answer the question. Um, we have already a few others. Uh, still, I would like to uh, continue. Go to your, Jan. Thanks again, Mike. Uh, Jan, maybe you can already start sharing your screen. Um, and we will come back to more general questions uh, in, the, in the overall discussion. Um, Jan Goetz is the CEO and co-founder of IQM. There, he and his team are developing quantum processes and devices, and he still keeps the connection to academia as an adjunct uh, professor at Aalto University. We are all, I think, very much looking forward to your talk, Jan. So please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for the nice introduction and giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I think this is really a great event, great speakers um, that you have pulled together also, especially in this. Um, and also, um, yeah, letting me share my view on common architectural software approaches. Um, and just to set a little bit the expectation, I, I will start with a slide about myself. So I'm experimental physicist and I do experiments with superconducting circuits like the one you see here. So I know how to throw a processor in the air and then I can observe that it falls down. So this is basically my level. Um, and um, of course, I'm um, coming from the science um, and I jumped right into entrepreneurship. So basically I went from the lab um, screwing cables together um, into the startup world. Um, and now I'm talking about software with this background. So this is just a little bit for the expectation management um, here. So I myself, um, when, when I think of a quantum computer, or at least the way I thought about this when I was still at the university, um, was basically like this. Um, so a quantum computer basically has two parts. The quantum uh, processing unit and maybe some control electronics or so. Um, and this is what you see in the lab. Um, and, and I think this is still what many physicists actually think, um, at, at least the experimental ones that are working in the lab a lot. Um, and I think this goes also along with what Mike has <laughs> told us earlier, that um, we, we need to find somehow a way to connect the, these two worlds and, and make people talk to each other with the same and, and common language. Um, so this is kind of where I started when, when, when we started IQM. Um, and basically then I started thinking a little bit more about what actually looks or like a, a software stack. Um, and so from an experimental CEO point of view, this is how a quantum computer stack looks like. Um, so there are now already maybe a few more boxes. Um, but still the question is actually quantum compiler. What is a quantum compiler? I don't know if you ask three experimentalists, you probably get three totally different answers. I don't know if you ask three software um, people <laughs> how aligned the answers are, but I think this also is a little bit the thing that we are just using words that we know from classical computing um, and, and everyone has a different um, kind of view on it. HPC integration, what does it actually mean? Is it hardware, is it software, where, where is the integration happening? Um, 
But anyways, these are the boxes that I currently have in my head when I think about a, a quantum computer stack, especially in including um, the software. And, and of course, the task of, of all of us is to fill this with much more detail and much more life and make sure that everyone actually talks the same language. And, and in the end, we build the same kind of machines that then also work and, and, use, uh, and, and can be used to solve real world problems. Um, so basically, the takeaway from, from this is that the only thing I really understand is there's a lot of stuff which I don't really understand, but we urgently need it. And it con uh, contains the control that was mentioned earlier, but then also compilers, algorithms, and, and all of this. And we need just very clever people to work on all of this. But we also need the people who then integrate actually this and make the system integration and make sure that there are standards and, and everything works together um, in the end. So this is kind of my big um, picture um, about this and I want to use the rest of my time to talk about these three points. The first one about IQM, not as a commercial, but basically to show you that what we are doing and what does this actually means in terms of software requirements, what do we need as a hardware company, what, what we are, um, and then which kind of, in, in the second point, which kind of role does software play um, in IQM. And then finally, um, I have a few pitfalls and best practices, which don't come from me, but actually I asked our software people and, and they gave me a few points that they said I, I should raise here. Um, so then you get firsthand information out of software people working in a hardware company. Okay, so let's start. So IQM, our, our slogan is we build quantum computers. So these are real machines. What you see here is nothing that we have in our lab yet, but this is kind of the vision that we have. So we want to have something that looks like a computer that works like a computer and that, can, that people can just use. And of course it contains then both hardware and software and we need to bring it um, together. So basically the task we have is take the picture on the left left, which is um, our lab um, in, in Finland, and convert it into something uh, on the right, which can be used as a product. Um, so we do this with um, two in, people in two offices um, here in Finland, where I am um, currently, where it's already um, deep in the night, and then also in Munich, where we are more focusing um, on application um, oriented processors and I will talk a little bit more on what this means and what kind of hardware uh, uh, software um, requirements come come out of this but this is kind of the the overall task um, that we have and just to show you where we are coming from I don't want to go through all the details but this is kind of a history slide you see that actually here in Helsinki there always have been very strong hardware activities starting with low temperature labs um, Blue Force is one of the prominent names that came out of the low temperature labs. Um, then we have a big foundry here to produce hardware. And actually the four founders of IQM, we are all um, experimental physicists. So we all um, have been working in the lab, but we, we are not very experienced on the software side. Um, and after starting, actually earlier this year, we hired Enrique Solano, who in this sense was the first person who has been working kind of on the software side, more on the algorithm side and, and theory side. So this is kind of where we are. So we are now having like a clamp building the low level hardware, but also thinking about how can this actually be used in the best way for the applications. And everything that comes in between actually, we have to fill somehow. Um, and somehow I think this is the, the question that we, we should answer in, in, in such kind of sessions that we um, have here. Um, just I want to announce this because this basically happened today and we are very proud of it um, that, that here in Helsinki we have a great ecosystem um, working in quantum. So we have many companies, I mentioned already Blue Force ourselves, but then we also have research VTT and Alto, all of them are working on the hardware side. We have actually a supercomputing center, CSC, which you can consider a software, um, but also there in this ecosystem point of view, actually, there's a lot of um, still to, to be developed um, also here in, in Helsinki. Um, and, and this is our goal to bring actually more software activities also here um, into the country. So this is basically how it looks like what we are doing. We are building chips, we're using superconducting technology. We are doing this in, in a big foundry. There's always a lot of snow in Helsinki um, and we are do, bringing into the lab and then we are using um, firmware, software compilers and all of this, all of this coming from different um, providers. Um, one aspect I want to mention is that actually um, as a, as a hardware company, we face the problem that the hardware at the moment is not powerful enough yet to solve any real world problem. So the question is actually, how can you build a very efficient processor? And here we are following this ASIC concept, 
which is a, a, a application specific concept um, where kind of you co-design the hardware so that it works for a certain application. And, and this kind of co-design between hardware and, and software must go hand in hand. So we have this very strong requirement here to the software side that actually there is a lot of interaction going on all the way up to the end user. So we, we have to talk to the people who want to use in the end um, the machines. And we have to make this communication through all the software layers to make sure that in the end we have a processor that works in an application specific way to solve um, a specific problem. So the question is how are this concept reflected in the software stack and how do we make sure that all the information is flowing and that everyone is talking in the same language and we are not losing half of the information that comes from the hardware and should be passed on to the software or, or vice versa. Um, here's another picture of a software stack where kind of you see this application specific implementation. So the idea is that we really have a, um, an architecture for um, the processor which can um, be adapted to the problem. So for example, you can change the topology of the qubits, the way they are connected. What does it mean for the compilers? You can change the gate set maybe. You can use analog gates or, or multi-qubit gates um, instead of only single and two qubit gates. And then again, what does it mean for the higher level of the software stack? Does it always have to readapt or can we find clever ways actually to be flexible and to react to such hardware changes? Um, and I think these are all questions that we, we must answer. What does it mean if someone makes a hardware change? What does it mean actually for the whole software stack? And can we build it in a way that it still stays operational? And this is kind of the task that we have in IQM and we have been thinking about this a lot and, and we are kind of getting there and, and finding solutions, but this is kind of um, where we are um, at the moment. So we have this kind of high level idea that we want to co-design quantum computers where we take input from both the, the application side and the hardware side and we then find an optimal mapping and this optimal mapping includes all these compilers in between and the question is how to do this in the most efficient way. So on the right hand side, you see actually a drawing from a whiteboard um, in our Munich office where people were brainstorming, what does co-design actually mean? Um, so on the highest level, you see the problem here, it's just depicted as a robot, which um, stands for artificial intelligence. This problem must be somehow encoded into an algorithm, so somehow mapped onto the um, algorithmic layer and then this algorithm must be mapped to the actual hardware in the most efficient way in the kind of sense of how should the topology look like which gate sets do we use and, and all of this and I think here again uh, we have to be um, always very careful in the way we design the software stack so that we can actually do such things and the question is who actually whose responsibility is it to integrate such concept is it the responsibility of the hardware providers is it the responsibility of the algorithm developers or is it the responsibility of um, some focused um, efforts of um, in between the software stack and i think these um, these questions um, are not yet fully answered um, but uh, we are getting more and more understanding um, throughout the process of developing um, the, the, the different software components. But the main question is, how does the stack actually look like? I think already now in the two talks, we have seen so many um, sketches of, of software stacks and some are more abstract, some are more detailed. Um, and um, is there actually a standard way? And can we use concept from classical software engineering and just map it to quantum computers? Or do we need different layers which are not there in the classical computers? Um, and, and this is, um, I think, still an open um, task. So when I ask our CTO, who is also an experimentalist, how, do our, how does our software stack look like? He gave me this picture. It's a little bit more complex than the one that I was drawing in the very beginning. It has more boxes and more errors. Um, and I think the main message here is there are actually quite a lot of interfaces on the way um, down the stack and also on the way up again the stack. And for all of these interfaces, do we actually already have standards yet on the hardware side and on the software side? And um, who, is, who is setting the standards? Do we leave this to the big um, corporates? Should this be a global effort? Should we have different standards in the US than in the Europe? All of these questions, I think, are also not really answered yet. So there's a lot of work to do. On the IQM side, what I can say is that we are kind of trying to build the software stack um, bottom up, but we are not doing all of this ourselves, but we see ourselves more like a system integrator. Um, and we are partnering up at the different stages um, with different partners. 
Um, and we are very strongly supporting standardization process, even though um, there are now a few activities going on, it's not very mature yet. And I think this is something we should also consider more and more in the future when, when building the software stack. So on the software partners, actually, there are, at the moment, we have only two officially listed um, software partners. Um, one is a, is a startup called Gus Quantum. They are developing um, financial applications. Um, and, and, and the other one is Atos, a, a big um, computing provider. For both of them, actually, our reason to choose them was more from a strategic point of view. So um, on the um, your side, it was um, our wish to get more um, domain knowledge on the actual applications and what do we need to reach to the highest level of the stack. And, and this is when we started talking to them and we decided to kind of um, go there um, together and, and develop some concepts together. Um, and on the other side, it's mainly um, the um, high performance integration since we think that quantum computing um, in the end um, belongs to the supercomputing centers of this world because it's kind of a way of doing high performance computing. And for us, it's very important to follow very closely what is going on on the supercomputing scene and how can we actually um, connect our um, devices to uh, an HPC infrastructure so that you can see them more like an accelerator point of view. So similar you to the way you're using GPUs in, in some uh, machine learning applications or so, you could use a quantum processor to accelerate some other tasks. So this is our way um, of thinking here. There will be more coming out, but there are still in the making. Um, and, but we are um, now um, really thinking about how to fill um, the stack upwards and, and who are the right partners. Um, and I think we will announce a few of them um, in the future. All right, finally, to, to finish this, I will just share um, with you um, some voices from our software team and, and what they think about um, all of this. So this is now the opinions that come straight um, from the developers. Um, the first thing they mentioned is that controlling large QPUs is really hard. Um, and it's nothing that you can do by just putting PhD students to the lab, but you need more sophisticated tools like the ones we have heard before from Pew Control, for example. Um, and also kind of the metrics that we are using are not always very helpful in, in kind of estimating where we want to go. So just always using the qubit count maybe is not the best way, but maybe we should find better benchmarks. But then there again, do we actually have standards for the benchmark? and who should set the standards? Are these the people who make the optimal control or are these the hardware providers or, or some other people? Um, same goes for calibration. How do we calibrate the qubits and, and how do we make sure that they are stable in time? As you know, there are these um, fluctuations going on from, from two level systems and others, um, which lead to the fact that qubits are, are not having constant parameters over time. Um, and, and this means we need to have an iterative process of fitting all the time um, some functions um, and, and optimize the parameters. So this is one very important thing um, for us as a, as a hardware provider. The other one is that we are not there yet. Um, and, and I think um, the, the first one is something that many people, uh, when they read through the literature, they see very simplified um, software stacks or quantum computer stacks. Um, actually, I am, I'm an author of one of such an article myself, so maybe <laughs> this is also what they mean, um, that um, sometimes it's misguiding if we see oversimplified sketches. But of course, also we need some simplification to make um, the technology available to the greater audience. Um, Maybe designing now um, very high level programming languages is not yet very helpful because we have still so much work to do on the low level um, side. Um, and, and, and then the question is, are there actually analogies between quantum and classical software stacks that we can use or will they look different? Um, and um, this is a very important thing. Um, on, on the best practical side, um, I think one, one thing is kind of in which mixture do you use quantum physicists and software developers to get the best results? Because physicists have the deep knowledge on what needs to be done, but maybe they don't know really the best practices on the software side. Um, so there was a, the recommendation to actually spend a lot of resources on the professional software infrastructure and involve the physicist in the software design um, and um, then kind of make a, a good combination of both of them because of course everyone has their own idea. And I think the, the main takeaway is here that everyone should be talking to each other, learning from each other, and then we should use some well-established software, um, software best practices. 
All right, um, I think this is my, my last slide for today. Um, some suggestions for general industry. Uh, we discussed this earlier, um, the importance of open source, um, what, what can be open source, what should uh, maybe not, um, and, and what are then um, the, the benchmarks that we should use um, for simulators, maybe also how can we simulate um, our, uh, our processors and then benchmark the actual experiments, again, uh, simulated experiments. Um, sharing articles is good, sharing articles and code is better, so I think this goes in the direction of the open source spirit, so that we, I think, still should be very openly communicating what we do and how we do it. Um, and I think the last point, again, is about the language that we use. What is a compiler? What does it mean? Is it this or that? Um, what is a QPU? What does, does it actually include? Um, and, and, and everyone probably has a different understanding of, of QPUs. Um, and, and it's very important that also here we find a standardized, standardized language. So again, I think the takeaway is that we should be talking to each other, we should be learning from each other, and then we should try to use well-established standardization practices. And maybe as a final question for this talk, um, this question, can there even be software standards when there are not yet any hardware standards? And, and, and does it make sense to develop software standards if the hardware still may, uh, may, uh, may change in the future? So as you see, there are a lot of questions for us as a hardware company, what software actually means, what do we need? I think we have some ideas of, of very specific requirements, but then especially the higher we go up in the, spec, uh, in the stack, um, the more um, uncertain it becomes. All right, so this is uh, from my side. We are always happy to get more people on board. Um, and yes, I'm happy to take um, any questions. Uh, great, thanks for the talk, Jan. Um, maybe we have time for one uh, short question. Um, there was the, the question, you mentioned that there are many standards, uh, different standard, standards for the interfacing are possible. Which one uh, would be the most important uh, to you? So where do you want, would wish uh, a standardization soon? Um, I mean, for us, um, one very useful thing would be that we say we have a, at, at the interface um, between the cryostat outside and inside, for example, then we can say, okay, we take care of everything that's happening inside the cryostat. And everything that outside, you can just plug in any other control system, for example. So this for us would be a very um, useful standard, just to give you one example. Basically, we think in boxes and we want that these boxes are interchangeable um, to be more general. Great, Th thanks a lot. Um, stay with us. Uh, we, I think it will get a really great discussion. Um, Maybe Jens, you can already start uh, sharing your slides while I introduce you uh, to the entire audience. Uh, please don't forget to post your questions to the particular uh, talk, but also for the discussion later. Um, Jens Helgard Nielsen is a software developer at uh, Microsoft Quantum. He's working on the Q Code project. Previously, he worked um, as a research developer at the University College in London, so also academia is uh, very familiar to him. Today he will talk about, you already can see it, Q-Codes, a component in the com common quantum software stack. I'm very curious to learn more about it. Jens, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, I'm not here to talk so much directly about um, all of Microsoft's uh, stack, but on a particular project, which is QCodes. And my talk is probably going to be a little bit different from the last two ones in that I am going to focus uh, a little bit more on uh, some of our experience of collaboration between software developers and hardware vendors uh, with a specific example of how we've been collaborating with uh, Zurich Instruments and try to raise some questions about how we can steer hardware and software development uh, together and, and do interesting things and sort of accelerate uh, that collaboration compared to what has happened um, in the past. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I see that Q codes could potentially be a part of a, a building block for, for designing your experiment. Um, so first, 
Q codes. What is up with that weird name with all these uh, weird capitalizations? Uh, so this is an acronym that's built from three universities, University of Copenhagen, University of Delft, and University of Sydney, that are all universities participating in the Microsoft Quantum collaboration. And that is where the name comes from. Um, and what is it then? Yes, it's a framework for instrument control in data acquisition. That also means specifically that we are a bit different situation from the last two examples. We are not a general purpose framework for doing uh, quantum computing specific experiments or, or quantum or control or anything. We are a framework for expressing your uh, experiments and interfacing with, uh, with um, hardware. Uh, it's purely written in Python and it's open source. It lives on GitHub. Um, it's got a fairly active a uh, number of collaborators and is used by a number of different projects. Um, and we sort of release our uh, code monthly in a new release monthly to, to the uh, Python package index, uh, where from it's installable via classical uh, Python means. And it's a project that's been around for uh, approximately five years. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what Q codes is, uh, just cover a few basic things that are going to be important for the discussion when we look at, at how we collaborated with ZI and what we've learned from that collaboration. Uh, so Q codes is built around one central abstraction that we have a parameter that basically represents something that's measurable or settable. So it has a name, it has a label and a unit and a value that can be set or get. Uh, so that basically enables you to perform simple experiments. You can set a parameter and measure another parameter. Um, we conceptually think of our instruments as collections of, uh, of these parameters that may be bundled together in channels. And then we think of something that we refer to as a station as a collection of instruments. Uh, that enables us to basically uh, reason about in, uh, experiments in two different ways. We may be measuring parameters as in the example on the right, or we may be thinking about all the things that don't change. So we don't, so all the things that don't change, we express as a, what we refer to as a snapshot. So we can see this basically contains information about all the values of all these parameters that haven't changed. Uh, that will be important in a second when we talk about uh, set I co-development. Um, yeah, and we provide a, a database interface for, for storing this. Um, and this is basically an example of how that looks in Python. I won't go too much into that, but the point being that you can write some fairly standard Python code that enables you to uh, loop over parameters or, or do whatever kind of measurement you want to do and, and store the results from those. Um, so in the next section, I want to dwell a little bit on, on collaboration between hardware vendors and software developers and not like us and, and experimentalists. So I don't know how many of you around here may be familiar with, with writing a driver for or interfacing with a classical uh, inter instrument, but typically that has historically looked something like that. You have a manual that contains uh, documentations of a Skippy protocol for a Visa instrument that tells you how to set the voltage or get the voltage on a different on a channel. Um, and basically, as a software developer, you uh, sit down, you implement all these APIs. And there's basically little to no interaction between uh, the, the driver developers, such as me, and, uh, and the original hardware vendor. It's, in our experience, often limited to bug fixes for very specific bugs or perhaps uh, clarifications on documentation. Um, and we can see historically that these APIs are huge and the drivers that we have are typically limited to the functionality that has been requested by a specific experimentalist and, and therefore implemented. Um, 
So I think this puts sort of the interaction between us and the hardware vendors in a bit of a sad state because there's not really any push to make the hardware uh, Skippy APIs any better because there's no feedback on what works and what doesn't work. And some of these APIs are maybe more convoluted and more hard to use than they could be. Um, and this was the state of things up, up until very recently, uh, for example, for our support for instruments from Zurich Instruments. Uh, we had a basically functional driver, but it was basically unmaintained for a long time because there were other priorities. Um, and there were occasional external collaborators that contributed small features to it, but basically it was, it was more or less um, as was and, and with limited support for new features as they were added. Uh, but the interesting thing happened in earlier this year that we were directly contacted by Zurich Instruments with the uh, specific request of whether we were interested in supporting a, uh, a set of drivers uh, for all their instruments that directly work together with Q-Codes. And after thinking about this for a very short time, our immediate response was that absolutely we have clearly have a common interest in making their instruments uh, as reusable, uh, as usable from our side as we can. And, and if they're willing to uh, support doing the development of the software, that's completely awesome. Um, this puts us in an interesting role where we've been used to being software developers and occasionally interfacing with, with hardware developers. And now we've suddenly found ourselves as the ones that support the hardware developers in, in developing the software, uh, whereas it's normally been the other way around. But all in all, I would say this has been a success and, and we saw the first release of this in, uh, in May this year. And they're available, uh, these drivers from, uh, from PyPI and, and open source and GitHubs. And we're sort of starting to see uh, the first enhancements and bug fixes to these coming in from scientists. Um, yeah, and I should give credit to the uh, the people at uh, at Zurich Instruments who actually implemented the drivers listed here. Um, so I want to dwell a little bit with like one of the things we learned from this uh, case study of a bug fix. Uh, so we remember we talked about the fact that Qcode drivers snapshot all these parameters by default, uh, and people familiar with ZI instruments will know that they have a huge API with lots of, of parameters exposed in a node tree. And some of these can only be measured when the instrument is in a certain state. Um, as the Qcodes developers, we of course know that this is a, this is a general thing and Qcodes is built to handle this. Um, so we were fairly easily able to contribute a fix uh, towards the, the set I driver that will fix this. However, uh, after a bit of back and forth, we learned that there was actually a better way because the ZI developers had detailed understandings of where to extract the relevant properties out of their parameters to be able to do this automatically. And I think by combining our knowledge of how Qcodes works and how our abstractions work with their knowledge about how ZI's APIs are designed, we were able to uh, come up with a solution that was the best of both worlds. Um, so I kind of want to put that question out there, like, is this kind of collaboration something we should strive to see more of in the future? Will it benefit both the, uh, the hardware developers and, and software developers and the experimentalists? Um, I mean, clearly it has the chance to get better feedback uh, of, of designs of APIs on both sides and also potentially give more fully featured drivers, uh, but there may also be uh, uh, reasons why we would not want to go this way. So I think that's an interesting question to put out there. Um, and for the last part of the talk, I just want to dwell on like how I see Qcodes as a potentially building block uh, for your experiment or for your quantum computing stack. Um, so Qcodes is an open source project. It's uh, funded by Microsoft, but we try to run it as, as an open source project that's useful for everyone. And we try to run it with uh, with good open source practices with like well well documented deprecated features not removing or changing or breaking apis um, 
shipping detailed change logs and uh, care about maintaining public APIs, being responsive on GitHub, having citable releases on, on Zenodo, um, and having sort of a fairly active, uh, active presence on GitHub. And the other thing I want to mention is that we are sort of hosting a repository of, of contributed drivers that enables uh, scientists to share drivers for a huge amount of instruments uh, that are used across across different labs, um, which obviously brings a lot of values to, uh, to users. Um, we found that we couldn't really officially maintain all of these drivers as part of QCodes itself because we neither have the instruments nor the time to actually develop these on our own. But what we can offer the community is help with reviewing drivers and support and educating them uh, in, in writing these instruments. So we've created a contributor driver repository, which is a way for people to share uh, packages between users. Um, so yeah, as I said, QCodes is a framework that allows you to express your experiments in Python code. And uh, we are always excited to engage in conversations about how we can make that better and, and welcome pull requests to make this better. But we'll make the point that, that it's meant as a general framework for powering your experiment. It is not a uh, specific tool for doing uh, uh, quantum computing experiments. Um, but perhaps there would be interest in, in running uh, repositories on a, on a way that's similar to the contributor drivers uh, for sharing code that's built on top of QCodes. Uh, and to facilitate this, uh, we've started maintaining a curated list of, of uh, projects that, uh, that use QCodes. Uh, and we've already talked about a few of them, the SETI QCodes drivers and the contributor drivers. But I want to put it out there that if anyone has built anything on, on top of QCodes, we are very excited to hear about it. And we would very much welcome a, uh, a pull request to, to tell us about it and tell the world about it. Uh, yeah. And with that, I would say thank you very much. Uh, great. Jens, thanks a lot for uh, this talk. Uh, I even learned a lot about uh, our joint project. Maybe you follow up with the first question. So, um, the CI about the CI collaboration. What exactly mm -hmm. is your or Microsoft's driver for such a collaboration? I mean, who are you or your customers, and how do you know what they need? Um, um, so this is uh, he, uh, the the. Person says, I, I am Anders from uh, QDevil and had, have had good support uh, for MS QCodes as well. So, um, yeah, yeah but, so, but I think so it's of a course, interesting question. Um, we, have, we have two interests. It's clear that our interests are primarily driven by uh, needs of experimentalists in our own lab, uh, which is also why we, had, we have. Uh, Set I driver to begin with because we have we have some of the instruments and we are interested in using the instruments But we're typically not committed to exclusively We may not be committed to exclusively using one instrument or instruments from one vendor So there may be priorities that means that we can benefit from this but secondary to that we Strive our best to, to run QCodes as an open source package that is useful for people across a multitude of different labs that are not exclusive to the interest of Microsoft Quantum. So uh, even if if someone approaches us and wants to develop a QCodes driver for an instrument that's not applicable and perhaps never will be applicable within Microsoft Quantum, we will be interested in supporting them to, to our best of our abilities. Um, we do also have okay. other drivers uh, uh, that have been contributed by, by the uh, companies developing uh, the hardware that we don't use directly. I think this is a very, very helpful information. Good, good to hear that. Um, you, you already mentioned uh, and you, uh, that QCodes is mainly kind of an interface to the hardware. Mm -hmm. There's a question going more in the qubit uh, direction. So uh, Tobias asked, um, so 
Q codes is a pretty cubic agnostic design. This is what you mentioned. Yeah. Um, did you see any limitations, examples where you observed that um, implementing a more qubit specific code would, bene would be beneficial? Um, I mean, it's it's clear that like the one way that I'm sort of we are thinking about this at the moment is that we can build and want to build our qubit specific code on top of this, uh, on top of the instrument control. It's clear. I mean, there, are, um, uh, yeah, there are different trade-offs, and it may be that we will well eventually revisit some of these decisions. But so far, we've enabled us to to do the type of experiments we've wanted to and we've been required to do with with a layer here, which is very agnostic to the type of experiment. Okay. Um, thanks for the answer. Uh, I think uh, with that, I would uh, like to start and open the discussion also to all other speakers and encourage the audience again to uh, submit further questions or if you want to say something, just raise your hand and we can also activate your microphone. Um, we had now three different talks uh, addressing the topic of software from slightly different directions. What was clearly one of the sentiments or what, what was the common thing uh, are the interfaces. And um, Moritz uh, wants to know how likely do you think it is to have a clear, clear interfaces at all? Or do we need an approach that incorporates all layers of the quantum software stack? I'm not sure who wants to start. Uh... Maybe, maybe I'll, uh, I'll jump in there. Then go, uh, um, go ahead, Mike. Uh, so, so it's obviously it's a very good question because it's a very hard question. Um, uh, our whole community and all the technology we're developing is at a very early stage and in flux. And I think that um, maybe the best way to think about it is uh, that interfaces can be enabled now via common tools. Mm -hmm. And so I mentioned and we heard in the other talks uh, the, the use of Python as a common programming framework. That allows mo most of our tools to speak to one another um, without having to make any kind of very specific one-off interface. Now that's quite powerful, um, but obviously that generalization uh, has costs in performance. And I think that the best way to proceed as the technology evolves is to use those common frameworks uh, with some level of abstraction as you, as you must when you use say Python. Um, and also the, the corresponding performance, slight performance hit, uh, such that we can see where the best points of connectivity are. And then once we identify those and the technology continues to mature, it may make sense to find certain points where we do a shortcut, right? Where, for instance, instead of interfacing via Python, we make a direct uh, interface to a Zurich Instruments um, driver via API or, or something as such. Um, but I think all of that needs to be teased out uh, in the wash, right? We have a long way to go in order to um, uh, solidify these things. And, and right now, I would say that it's the combination of, uh, of interfacing with flexibility that really makes all this work. Okay, thanks. Jan? Yeah, I would just add to this that in my opinion, at the stage where we are currently, where still many things are not 100% um, clear, I think having many interfaces is not a bad thing because it, allow, it allows us to change um, stuff. If we would have everything in one fixed flow, um, it's very hard to change something in between. Um, so I, actually, I think it's good that we at the moment have many interfaces and maybe once certain blocks of the quantum computer become more clear, then we can start discussing how to, to integrate and maybe get rid of some of the interfaces. Hey, Jens, I saw you were nodding. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, that, that seems like the way forward. I think it seems very optimistic to think that anyone could perceive what what these interfaces and where the right interfaces are. I mean, we've certainly, on the sort of low-level instrument stack, learned a lot about where interfaces shouldn't be and how to move them around and things we would have done differently uh, and that we have eventually done differently, but it took some learnings. Uh, so it seems like 
the only way to to know this is to create the interfaces and learn where the where they are and where they work uh, by going forward. I'm, I'm I'm very happy that we seem to have pretty pretty broad consent there. Um, I would go in in a very similar direction. Um, Mike, I know you partially answered it in the chat, but I would like to highlight this question for the, for the audience. So the question is mainly to Jan, but also partially, I think, uh, to Jens. Uh, when sharing code, how easy is it for someone to read a different code when there are uh, the, these fundamental differences still in the, in the approaches? Well, um... I, I can share one, one story from my PhD time when I was using code and there was some comments made, I think, in Italian or Spanish or so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think about reading code, it's, I think it's all about following standard and, and best practices. Um, mm -hmm. and, and everyone should, of course, agree on the same standards and, and best practices and, and then it should be possible. Um, mm -hmm. This is my, my taking on it and here I think one of the problems we have that to a large extent code is still produced by physicists and they don't know these best practices. So the question is, how can we teach the physicists in a way that, that they will follow them? Because as you know, also physicists are lazy people. Once they reached a stage that works, they don't want to work on it anymore because they found the solution, right? So I think this is kind of the mindset that we, we have to change. And, and this is a task, I guess, for, for everyone to do this. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, this, I, this, this, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I was going to say that I completely agree with that. And I think like sort of one of the benefits that we also see out of running an open source project that gets lots of contributions from uh, master students and early career PhD students that are typically not very experienced is that we can use it as a, we do a bit of training, both of our internal and external collaborators. And we spend a lot of time teaching people basic things of Git and how to write good doc strings and how to write a reasonable example of what their uh, instrument driver is doing and, and stuff like that. And, and we can see an enormous progression from the people that are interested in it, the physicists that are interested in that pick it up and, and move from this level to like at least a reasonable software proficiency uh, fairly quickly and sort of start understanding what these things are about. Yeah, maybe so, let me add to that for a second. I think um, it highlights a really important point that, or, uh, that, that Jan was making a moment ago. Um, many of us as experimentalists see code as a means to an end. And, um, and frankly, that's, that's, that's fair in most cases because we're trying to run some experiment and we want to get some measurement and nobody is going to reward us for having nice code. Um, the other side of that is when you have professional engineering, whether it's by a Microsoft and an open source package or a, a smaller company like QControl and proprietary or open source packages, um, we're building products and the whole motivation is completely different. The, 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 the value that we deliver is in usability and maintenance, et cetera, uh, and functionality, not just getting to the end point. And um, I think bringing that perspective into how we design and build quantum computers is, um, is, is quite important. Yeah, there was a, this kind of a follow-up question from, uh, from Tobias. Um, are there concrete ideas on how to teach physicists more efficient, effectively. I mean, because Jens, you already mentioned you are doing basically some teaching. Um, um, is is that, it, it? Does it have to be more standardized? Is, does it have to be more forced? This is. I mean, I we are this. certainly thinking like internally in our our collaborative universities about having a a sort of short course of some sort that will give internally to people just showing them a bit of uh, basic software engineering uh, but it's clear that the sort of approach of teaching people one by one when they contribute git pull request does not necessarily scale particularly well but it's very efficient when when people actually learn these things um, so yeah it's probably going to be a little bit of, con of, of combinations I think I think it's important that like software is a tool for the experimentalists, as is the the, the 
login amplifiers and the other electronics and a lot of these things you need to learn how to use so you also need to learn how to use the software uh, that you do you use to perform your measurements you may not need to be a professional programmer but you need to have some um, some level of proficiency yeah. great uh, th thanks a lot um now i would like to go slightly back in the direction of what kind of um good software means uh, mike you already mentioned okay we, we, you provide kind of products um how can we verify the output of software? Uh, I think also Gaia uh, asked this question to some extent. Um, do you have a suggestion for this, Mike? Um, I, I actually think, you know, this comes up a lot. I think it's not actually that hard. Um, and it, it comes be because of some of what uh, we heard from the other talks in, in terms of interfacing, right? Nobody here, believe, I, don't, well, I won't speak for anybody else, but I, I don't think there is any kind of consensus that we should abstract things to the point that no one knows what's going on code-wise inside certain layers of the, uh, of the instrument stack. Like, you know, we're not trying to obfuscate how you're sending commands to a Zark instruments box. We're not trying to obfuscate how an FPGA is controlled, et cetera. And as a result, um, for Q control, for instance, it's very, very easy to take the output of our optimizer, look at the solution directly, run your own independent verification or use our verification tools or run it directly on hardware to know if, if the solutions are working, right? So uh, with that, um, because we are not yet at a point where everything is abstracted and, and the whole stack is closed up, but rather we are focused on making sure uh, that you know, each of our different contributions can interact with as many different pieces of hardware or software as possible. It, it looks very easy to have like the, uh, from an experimentalist perspective, you have the monitor port, right? That we can look in at the signal that's being <clears throat> generated and ensure that it is what we expect and not simply have to rely on, well, the quantum computing algorithm did the following thing and, and either that's good or it's bad. So I, I think that um, we should, it, there's a difference between having that kind of access and uh, the kind of access that sometimes is demanded by, by um, the open source community. You know, I wanna see the guts inside of how your optimizer works. Um, uh, I appreciate that there are some people, for instance, who do want that. Uh, that's a little bit of a personal curiosity issue. Um, I could say, like, how many of us look inside a PDF renderer, right, and demand that we see what's going on in Adobe Creative, Creative Suite? Um, what matters is the output. And I think that's the, the, the thing that everybody is allowing to be accessed at this point. Um, yeah, maybe I would give you the word because you mentioned during your talk also, okay, in the end, you, it, it matters uh, what the software can do and you can imagine to put uh, a lot of those boxes together. Well, if we, if we stick to this box thinking, which in my simplified mind, um, I do a lot is then, of course, it's important that the boxes, they kind of work together. Um, and if I change one box, I don't want to change all of the other ones as a result of it, right? Um, so this maybe is then again related to the interfacing, but of course also the software should be written in a way that it allows this actually. And if it's too stiff and it doesn't allow us to change somehow the environment, um, it's also not, not very helpful. Um, so for us, again, from the perspective of a system integrator, um, software is helpful if we can just edit or, or replace it without having to think about which kind of other ends of the quantum computer then we have to change as a result of this. Um, you, you also mentioned a um, uh, very important topic before. Um, Moritz brought that up again. You, sa you said we use terms from classical computing to describe uh, the functionality of certain parts of the entire uh, software stack. Do you have the feeling that uh, to some extent limits the kind of flexibility to adapt to the requirements of quantum computing software? I don't know if it's limit. I mean, people usually think in pictures and many people are very experienced with classical computers and they <laughs> there when you say something like motherboard or I don't know something, then, then you have somehow a feeling what this is. Um, and, and I think in this way, these kind of analogies can help to a certain mm -hmm. extent but of course if they lead to misconception 
um, then it can go also in the wrong way. So I think where, where we somehow have to educate ourselves and, and others is which of the analogies are valid and are helpful and maybe which are the ones um, that are going in, in the wrong direction. And for me, not being a specialist in the field, um, I'm actually having a, a hard time then saying which are the good analogies and which are the bad ones, but maybe some of the other speakers have a better um, idea which, which are good and bad analogies. Maybe I'll pick up on that. I think, uh, I think there has been a little bit of uh, the community being led astray by reliance on uh, these kinds of abstractions that link to conventional computing. Um, I, I think the important distinction is that those uh, abstractions and the separations, the hard separations between, say, different layers of a notional stack, that's extremely important to what you could call quantum computer science, where we want to understand what is the potential asymptotic performance of some quantum computer. Could you build something that is uh, fault tolerant and uh, is going to allow an uh, arbitrarily large computation to occur uh, given some performance requirements. I mean, quantum error correction as an example was extremely important to that. It took the notion of, of error correction and say radiation hardened uh, processors, adapted it to a need and was then used to, de to demonstrate that in principle we can build really big machines, right? So it's very important for quantum computing, quantum computer science. But when it comes to engineering practical systems, I think it actually is quite harmful because ultimately um, the challenge that's being addressed by uh, quantum error correction is one of hardware stabilization. And QEC is one ingredient of that, but from a control engineering perspective, it's just feedback, right? And so there's some feedback controller with a different measurement model. And there are all sorts of things that can go into feedback stabilization of uh, any classical hardware and presumably also uh, quantum hardware in the future. And so the fact that we've only looked at quantum error correction as this very isolated part of the stack, I think is quite limiting. And a lot of the power comes when we think about uh, breaking out of the, you know, the, the pure fault tolerant paradigm towards, for instance, what goes on in cat codes, right? Where you, you give away the idea of fault tolerant error correction uh, in exchange for actually augmented performance against the dominant sources of error in your system or the integration of low level open loop control with higher level encoding and feedback stabilization. I think that's where you can get the biggest benefits and it requires breaking out of those uh, firm abstractions that we've uh, adopted so far. Uh, yeah, Jens, I think you also nodded before. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything particularly to add. I mean, that, that certainly, yeah. Okay. A useful um, thing. I mean, I, the one thing that strikes me is like, this happened before in the sense that computer science talks about entropy and like <laughs> that was basically a topic that, a term that was borrowed from physics and like, there are similarities, right? But those two concepts are quite different in many ways. Uh, so sort of, yeah, that's just random thought. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so, so, so you say we have to be careful if we use the same terminology, which might be similar, but not uh, this, actually the very same thing. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen that in, in many other fields and quantum computing is not unique in, in that uh, capacity. But maybe it's more pronounced in quantum computing because quantum is so different uh, and there are so many things that we are sort of trying to get grasped on. Yeah. Um, I would, I, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I would like to uh, have a, basically put out a last question there uh, to all of you. Maybe we can make a short round. Um, we discussed a lot about the interfaces, which are very helpful. And at some point, we need to have a certain consolidation of the interfaces. Do you have an idea uh, how this could happen? Is it just kind of try and error? What's what stays is good, or uh, do you have a bigger picture on how we could achieve that? Well, my, my opinion is that on the long term, the market will take care of this. Um, because if, if the quantum computers will be commercialized, which I think most of us here hope, um, <laughs> then um, the, there will be 
market forces pulling in this and that directions. And usually, um, if you think about how standardization in other industries works, this is then how it is. Um, it doesn't always have to be the best standard that is successful. We have this, the, the VHS tapes, for example, right, and, and other examples. Um, and, and there are then other aspects um, that, that come into it. So I really think once the whole thing starts flying, um, there will be some market dynamics which will take care of these um, interface standardization topics anyway. I, I see mainly nodding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think uh, I think you know we're 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 sitting here in a uh, Zurich Instruments uh, sponsored session, um, which is uh, indicative of the presence that Zurich Instruments plays in the field. And so, to echo Jan's point, um, you know, we write interface software for things that are widely adopted by the community. And I think Jens would say the same thing. You know, you're not going to write drivers for some very niche piece of hardware that no one has ever asked you to write uh, a driver for, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the market helps determine where we should focus our, our resources. And then we find common ways of communicating. Uh, those common ways are things like Python or APIs. And, um, you know, I, I did want to make one quick point on APIs. Uh, we, we talk about them a lot. Um, I think uh, from the software engineering versus, uh, say, quantum physicist side, there is a, there's a pretty big gap in the way we approach them or the way we expect them to operate. Uh, and I'll give one quick anecdote. When QControl launched our uh, API-based uh, cloud compute engine, we did everything using... Um, a REST API. So this is the, the most standard form of, of web interface. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a very elegant way of moving and manipulating information when it comes to, you know, somebody who has training as a, a software engineer or a software developer. Um, but most uh, users of the software, most people who have a background in quantum physics or, and want to apply control to their hardware or, or, or similar, um, they, they don't have that background. And mm -hmm. so a REST API was just like this un, unbelievably confusing object-oriented programming approach that didn't make sense to them. And so we ended up making a switch to GraphQL, which is a query-based API that looks a lot more like uh, what a, a user might expect from you know writing something in Mathematica or, or similar. And I think um, there's a, a lot of opportunity for our community to settle on um, you know, the best user experience uh, across these different domains as we cross from, you know, the software engineers over to mm -hmm. the, the physicist users where there's, there is a need for some commonality that has not always mm -hmm. existed. Yeah. The one point I was sort of trying to make about interfaces was also that the way we've been able to like have some active collaborations, whether it's said I on on like instrument interfaces, I think is an important point that these instrument interfaces are not just set in stone by one party and are as useful or not useful as they are, but that you try to think about mechanisms where there are collaborations across the interfaces and we shape the interfaces so they look in a way that works well from both sides. Um, yeah. Which sort of goes along with what Mike said. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to our three speakers. Uh, I, I have a, the feeling there's a lot of consents there. Um, let, me, let, let me give the possibility to summarize uh, basically our whole, our whole experience uh, in, of our entire um, workshop. So for the first part about the approaches between academia and industry, uh, we could clearly conclude that industry and academia can tackle different challenges. Therefore, the collaboration uh, should be intensified. One of the crucial points is the education of the future workforces uh, for the success. Uh, in the second part where we talked about common architectural approaches for quantum hardware, it was clearly the design of qubits and uh, the te to tackle the engineering challenges one at a time, uh, as well as um, current technology is clearly limited. So for answering, um, it's good for answering principal questions and to do benchmarking, but if we really want to scale up, 
to millions of qubits, uh, there might be a few new approaches needed. Um, and for this uh, session, I will clearly con uh, conclude that uh, you can never have uh, too much interfaces because this helps you to keep the software flexible and partially interchangeable. Um, and I think everybody feels the need for professional software uh, written by software engineers. Um, and with this, I would like to thank again all speakers uh, in all sessions, everybody here. Thanks for staying so long with us. Uh, have a good day, night, or evening, wherever you are. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh.